Hi everyone, my name is Santiago, this is Dominic. We both work in V8, which is a JavaScript engine that is, uh, it's, it's used in many places, including Chrome. Today, we will give you a high-level overview of the JavaScript execution pipeline in V8. Okay, um, so in this talk, we will mostly focus uh, on JavaScript's execution pipeline, but we will also talk about memory management, WebAssembly a bit, and DevTools. And in the end, we will give you an overview of what the V8 team is currently working on. So let's first define some terminology that often comes up with uh, JavaScript and V8. So uh, V8 is Chromium's um, JavaScript implementation, or actually Chromium's ECMAScript implementation. V8 is named after the car engine type. Um, and you will see that many names of components um, in this project um, um, Many names of components in this project are, um, have similar names and uh, were inspired by this project name. So these days, um, V8 uh, not only implements uh, JavaScript, but also WebAssembly. And um, V8 is not only used in Chrome, but also in many other projects, uh, most prominently in Node.js. And in Chrome and Blink, we use a convenience library for interacting with V8. It's called Chin. But this library is also used in other projects, for example, the PDF viewer. Blink then um, obviously adds another library on top of that, so-called Blink bindings. And this uh, layer is responsible for exposing web APIs uh, to JavaScript. So a single instance of V8 is called an isolate. And each isolate in V8 has a separate garbage collected heap. That means it's not possible to pass an object directly from one isolate to another. Um, in Blink, uh, we use um, um, one isolate per renderer process. And all um, websites in the same process also share the same isolate. And uh, there's a, obviously an exception to that rule uh, that are web workers, uh, since each worker gets its own uh, isolate as well. Within an isolate, there are then one or more um, V8 contexts. And in Chrome, we have one context uh, for each iframe. And uh, in addition, for each uh, extent extension, we also have a uh, separate context uh, for each iframe. Um, so you can imagine that there can be quite a lot of context within a single isolate. And uh, Blink bindings usually refers to a context uh, through the script state class. Uh, class. And there's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the script state and uh, the V8 context. So let's uh, start to look into how JavaScript code gets executed in Wait. So in, in the first step of the execution pipeline, <laughs> we need to load um, some source code. And in Wait, uh, we actually don't know how to download a file. Um, this is the embedder's job uh, to provide the script. And in the case of Blink, uh, the script is loaded like any other resource. So the resource might come from the network, the cache, or a service worker. V8 also might uh, be able to cache uh, the bytecode for a script. So um, instead, uh, on a warm load, we might skip parsing and then directly load the bytecode for the file. Um, another feature that um, V8 supports is streaming parsing. So streaming parsing allows us to parse a file while the file is being downloaded. Um, and this helps us to hide the cost of parsing in, in the network layer. The next step in the execution pipeline is the parser. Um, initially, um, the scanner takes the stream of characters from the, um, from the script and produces a stream of tokens. And that uh, stream of tokens is then passed as input to the parser. The parser is a handwritten recursive descent parser. It takes that uh, stream of tokens and produces an abstract syntax tree. And in V8, there are actually two kinds of parsers, the pre-parser and the full parser. Um, the pre-parser helps us uh, to defer the cost of fully parsing a function uh, to improve startup. Um, pre-parsing is cheaper because it only does a syntax pass and some early error checking. Um, but for example, it doesn't uh, produce an abstract syntax tree yet. Um, so let's look into uh, a simple script and what the parser generates for that. So there's a simple script with a function foo, a local variable b, an assignment to that local variable, and a return statement. The parser generates uh, this abstract syntax tree. So there's a function literal for the function itself, a block node uh, for the function body, a variable declaration for the local variable b, and uh, two nodes for the assignment and the return statement. 
You can also see that there are uh, variable proxies that are references to variables. Um, initially, those uh, two variable proxies are unresolved. That means uh, we don't yet know uh, what uh, variable uh, those two nodes refer to. Um, and the parser not only generates the EST, but also it uh, constructs scopes. And each scope contains a list of all declared variables in it. So in our little script, um, the global scope would contain the function foo. And in the uh, scope for the function, we would uh, uh, only have the variable b. And uh, after passing is completed, we run scope analysis. And in this phase, uh, we figure out that both variable proxies refer to the same variable b. So then we move on to the next part of the pipeline, which is the interpreter called ignition. As we previously saw, we have the output of the parser, which is the AST. This is fed as input to the bytecode generator. The bytecode generator generates a stream of bytecodes. Then these bytecodes get executed one at a time by the interpreter. There are several ways of building an interpreter. One would be to have a huge switch case scenario in which we'll describe what to do for each particular bytecode. B8 has an indirect threaded interpreter. We have a huge, uh, huge table of handlers keyed by bytecode so we can look for a particular bytecode, its handler, jump to it, and start executing code. Our interpreter has registers. They function similarly to machine registers, but they actually live in the stack. Bytecode is the source of truth for the interpreter, our optimizing compiler called TurboFan, and the DevTools. This means that once we generate all this bytecode, we can discard the AST because we are not going to be needing, we are not going to be needing it again. We record all sorts of metadata in the bytecode, such as the source <coughs> position and the handler step. In this example, we have a function and the bytecode that we generate from it. The bytecodes have been carefully selected to represent JavaScript efficiently and compactly, as one of Ignition's main goals was to save memory. It has a single accumulator register that most operations reference. For instance, we have test equals strict, and you don't see the accumulator there, you just see the A. This is because the Accumulator is used implicitly over there. We're comparing the A, which is passed to the function as arguments, against the accumulator. Then we also have a stack pointer that is updated once per call frame, which provides the base of a stack-based registers. These are often the local variables of a function. And JavaScript objects, which are allocated in the JavaScript heap, cannot be directly embedded in the bytecode. We have a fixed array called the constant pool. We store the value there and then their index in this array is what we embed in the bytecode. The optimizing compiler uh, in V8 chips with a code generator, which uses a custom machine-independent portable assembler. The interpreter uses uh, this assembler to generate code uh, for the bytecode handlers to get portability and interrupt with the optimizing compiler. This fits in the lowest tier of TurboFan, our optimizing compiler, so we get some optimizations for free. This is an example of uh, how a handler for a bytecode is generated at compile time. This generates the machine code that then gets run by the interpreter. Here uh, in the highlighted line, we get uh, generate the code to get the register by looking up the next byte in the bytecode. Then we generate the code to load the register, load the accumulator, and generate the add stuff for the JS add operation. Then we generate the code to store the result back into the accumulator and dispatch for the next bytecode. Once we have all this bytecode generated, we can start executing it. JavaScript is a dynamic language, and even simple things like loading an object.foo can have uh, complex semantics. For instance, it could mean loading a simple property, calling a getter, or walking through a prototype chain. Figuring out what to do dynamically is rather slow, what we do instead is we cache it and hope that the next time we encounter it, we would like to do the same thing. What we do in this scenario is we call get property with two slots in the feedback cache. In the first slot, we will have the shape of, of the object, its structure. And in the second one, the bit field containing what to do. If the shape matches, so if the cache actually works, it's, if it's a match, we already know what to do and don't have to do any dynamic lookups. In the case the feedback is not there, or if it's not a match, what we need to do is figure out dynamically what to do and then update the feedback cache. So the next time we encounter it, we will hopefully don't have to figure out everything dynamically again. 
So I talk about the structure of objects. How do we do it? Object shapes, are also, which are also called hidden classes in literature. In V8, we call them maps, uh, but it's roughly the same name. They represent the structure of a JS object, how the properties and the elements are stored. First of all, we create an empty shape for the empty object we draw. Uh, it's empty because it has no properties whatsoever. When, once we create a new JS object, we store a pointer to this shape in the JS object. Then, the, when the constructor hits this dot x, it will, has to, it will have to add this property to the shape. It creates a new shape with the information about this new other property, where to find it, its name, and any attributes it may have, for instance, if it's read-only. Then it updates the shape pointer from the JS object to the new shape. It will now represent an object with uh, the property x at offset 4. Then we also add a transition from the old shape to the new shape. This is done so for the next time we encounter this dot x, we don't have to create a new shape. We just have to follow the transition tree. So when we hit the second property, we do the same thing. We create a new shape, update the shape pointer, and then add the transition. So now we can detect object shapes, and we are executing. While we, while we are executing, we are collecting all this type feedback. So how do we do it? Again, we have an o.foo. At first, we don't have any feedback, so everything's uninitialized. And we have two slots, as I said. In the first one, we will store the shape or the structure of the object, and the second one, a bit full containing what to do. So we encounter an object, has foo, perfect. We, have the we store the shape, and we have the bit field. We transition from an uninitialized state into a monomorphic state. This means we only have one shape. What happens when we encounter a second object? Well, now this object doesn't even have the full property. It's a totally different object. So we would need to return undefined. And now we have two types. So we change from a monomorphic state into a polymorphic state. We store polymorphic in the, in the slot where the shape would be. And the second slot now becomes a pointer. It's now a pointer, uh, it's called a handler's array. So it's a pairs of shape bit fields. Well, we will now, we need to, in the case we hit this again, we go through the handler's array and check all the shapes. So the interpreter ignition only gets us so far. If a function gets hot enough, we will optimize it, optimize it in our optimizing compiler to make it faster. And not only that, the type feedback helps the execution uh, in, for the interpreter, but we can also use it as input for our optimizing compiler. It will generate optimized code based on the type feedback we have seen so far. TurboFun is a sea of nodes, rough-based compiler. Nodes are expressed as being inputs to one another. At first, we only know that which nodes depends on which. Schedule happens way later. This gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of moving code around in the graph. For instance, hoisting nodes outside of loops. As I said, functions are compiled individually once they're hot. We don't do a full code chain. We've found out that this is better. And generate, everything gets generated from ignition bytecode, so there's no need to generate the AST all over again. Turofan works in stages or phases, where we go from a high level to a low level representation. We start with a representation which is similar to JavaScript. For instance, load a value from an array. Then we lower into a simplified where we have, for instance, a bounce check followed by the load of this value from an array if the bounce check is successful, and lower even more into machine, which is roughly assembly level. The last step is uh, machine code. So we go into culture. That last part is architecture dependent, and most of our, the, the rest of the phases are actual architecture independent, so we can reuse the same optimizing compiler for all of the architectures. These are some examples of the reductions we can do. We can do constant folding, reducing several nodes into one. Strength reduction, by we can do make some operations faster. GVN, or global value numbering, in where we reduce duplication of nodes in the graph. And we can also do algebraic reassociation, which in a, in a way is similar to constant folding, but it's a bit more complicated. So we optimize all of these functions based on the type feedback we have seen so far. But what happens when this assumption of types is not what we expect? Then we have to deopt or deoptimize and go back into the interpreter. Sadly, we have to throw away all the, the optimized code, go back into interpreted code, and resume execution from there. We also update the type feedback, so the next time we encounter it, 
uh, this point. Hopefully, we will not deopt and continue work in optimized code. So we have to go back to interpreted code. And if this function gets hot enough, we will re-optimize. And this will maybe be yellow. To do all of this, we have to associate metadata in every point in optimized code and then cause one of these deopts. So um, another important component in V8 is the garbage collector. The garbage <coughs> collector manages memory. And among other things, it's responsible for allocating and deallocating objects. Um, V8's garbage collector is called Orinoco. And Orinoco is a tracing garbage collector. Um, and tracing garbage collector collection is opposed to a reference counting, for example. That means on um, during a GC cycle, um, Orinoco will compute the set of all reachable objects. And all objects uh, not reachable from the application are considered garbage and dead and can be reclaimed by the garbage collector. Um, v8 also uses a generational heap layout. That means that the heap is split into a new space and an old space. New objects are allocated in the new space, uh, while the old space is used for a long living object. <coughs> um, the generational heap layout is based on the assumption that most objects die young. There's, then there's another um, space um, in our heap, the code space. And we have that because memory pages uh, for generated code need to be set um, executable. And we don't want to do that for regular objects. So V8 also tries to aim uh, for low latency and high throughput. Um, but these goals are usually conflicting. And we try to achieve this by performing work incrementally in parallel, that means on multiple threads, and concurrently. That means, for example, on a background thread while the application keeps running. Nate's GC is also tightly integrated with Blink's OEPAM GC. And it's quite uh, tricky to um, synchronize two independent GCs with each other. In V8, we solve this by simply computing the live objects across the JavaScript and C++ boundary. And this um, makes it possible for us to handle reference cycles between JavaScript and OEPAM objects uh, gracefully and not leaking memory. In V8, we actually have two different kinds of collection, a minor collection and a major collection. The minor collection will only reclaim memory in the uh, new space, while the major GC will uh, reclaim memory in all spaces. Um, yeah, the new space is again split into two equally sized uh, semi-spaces. And a minor GC will uh, copy live objects from the currently used semi-space into the other one. Objects that are, uh, survive the second minor GC are, are promoted into the old space. And the typical pause time of this uh, collection are up to one millisecond. Um, the major GC, um, as already mentioned, reclaims memory in all spaces. And uh, it con usually consists of multiple phases. So initially, we mark all reachable objects. And that work um, is performed incrementally and concurrently and in parallel. Um, a major GC will also perform compaction. That means uh, live objects on almost three pages are evacuated to uh, other uh, pages to reduce memory. And since we um, move objects, we also need to update references to the, those objects that have been moved. A major GC also needs to sweep pages. That means we need to iterate the page and add a free area uh, to the free list uh, for subsequent allocations. Um, the major GC also always runs uh, Blink's OLPEN GC. So uh, each time a major GC in V8 is performed, also the um, OLPEN's uh, heap will be uh, collected. And the typical pause time of these uh, collections are, are up to 10 milliseconds. Um, as already mentioned, um, V8 also supports um, WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is a low-level execution format. It's designed to be used as a compilation target um, WebAssembly is statically typed, and there's a well-defined text and binary encoding with a one-to-one -one translation between them. And here on the slides, you see uh, uh, both encodings uh, for a simple function that gets a 32-bit integer as an argument, multiplies it by two, and returns it. V8 uh, fully validates each model before it gets executed. And um, similar to JavaScript, uh, WebAssembly uses multiple tiers for compil compilation and execution. Liftoff is used as a baseline compiler. And the goal of the baseline compiler is to produce uh, machine code as fast as possible to help with startup. Um, WebAssembly also then reuses Turbofan for uh, optimizing hot functions. 
the machine code generated by TurboFan is faster compared to liftoff, but on the other hand, TurboFan also takes a lot longer to compile uh, code. And um, unlike JavaScript, uh, there are no de-optimizations performed in WebAssembly. V8 also implements the backend part of Chrome uh, DevTools. So um, DevTools supports basic debugging functionality, like setting breakpoints, step single stepping through code. But it also supports more uh, powerful features, like for example, live edit, where you can edit the source code without uh, reloading a page. You can also take performance profiles of a website. And for better understanding memory usage, you can, for example, take heap snapshots or allo uh, profile allocations. So we've now seen all the various parts of V8, but where does V8 uh, itself actually spend most of its time during execution? And uh, traditional benchmarks like Octane, um, they had a strong focus on execute, uh, executing optimized code. But when we look at the loading profile of real world websites, we see that the profile looks quite different. So there's a lot less time spent in the generated code, but much more time uh, in the runtime and in parsing. And based on these observations, uh, we try to um, pick areas to focus on and optimize for. So as a result of these efforts, uh, page load has uh, improved quite a lot compared to previous releases. And here for this particular uh, Facebook site um, that we test often for, um, page load has more than halved. So we have now seen where V8 spent its time, but where do the V8 de developers spend their time on? So we are constantly implementing new features, uh, ECMAScript features, as they are being standardized. So for example, we've recently shipped class fields, and currently we are working on weak references and optional chaining. In WebAssembly, we are trying to uh, improve and extend the standard and uh, implement features like reference types and SIMD. 